Bienvenue, uh, Cajun Coding. Uh, this is St. Raz again, and we're still working on the Warm Up 2 section of Java on the Coding Bat website, and only four exercises left, so we should be able to finish that easily in the time of this episode. I was doing a little work earlier and was listening to music while I was coding, and that is a not a very controversial subject, but it's one that some people disagree with. Should I listen to music while I'm coding? And my attitude is that the important thing is, as with many other things, do what works for you, but the important thing is that you be honest with yourself. You might make excuses, and you might be able to convince someone else or come up with an argument that sounds plausible, but be honest with yourself. Uh, if it helps you concentrate, go ahead and do it. Uh, you might have to use headphones or whatnot, depending on your environment. But go ahead and do it. Now, some of my very favorite music is music that I can't listen to while I'm coding. Uh, for the most part, people who like to listen to music when they're coding, uh, a lot of times it's it's uh, instrumental music. It doesn't have lyrics. Lyrics uh, can distract you. You know, when you're hearing words, when you hear human speech, your brain tries to process that and or you may be summoning up the lyrics you're familiar with yourself, so you're accessing your memory. So there's some cognitive overhead on that. On the other hand, if you're listening to music that has no lyrics, then you're not going to be distracted by that. Your brain's not going to be trying to do anything like that, so you can concentrate on the code. Um, so, And some people, I had a physics uh, professor, said the best thing was classical music, not only because of the lack of lyrics, but also because it lacks uh, a lot of crescendo in most cases, you know. So it's not a lot of ups and downs. It's nice background ambient noise type thing. Even though I, I don't listen to um, I don't listen to classical so much when I'm coding. I'm listening to like you know electronic music and stuff like that. But but in any case, just be honest with yourself. Go ahead and try it. Put on whatever you want. And uh, if you find that you're getting distracted by the music. Or your you know performance is, is not uh, it's not working well, then uh, then try something else or maybe just code without music. So, but on to the exercises here. Warm up string yak. Suppose the string uh, yak y a k is unlucky. Given a string, return a version where all the yak are removed, but the a can be any character. The yak strings will not overlap. So we're going to be returning a new string, so let's go ahead and declare our answer string and initialize it as empty. And of course we're going to be going over this string and extracting a substring of it, or possibly the whole thing. But uh, we're going to iterate over that with a for loop. And we're going to remember to call the length method on the string str object. And remember our parentheses there. And inside our for loop here. Now, uh, we're going to be returning a version without the yak, or I should say yxk, uh, because it's going to be the y and then the A in the middle of that three character substring can be anything. So what we're going to do is if str substring oh actually we can do character at. Let's do character at. A uh, little more succinct there. Character at I equals Y and str care at and this is going to be i plus two because it's going to be two characters to the right that middle quick character can be anything close that so if that statement resolves to true we're going to exclude those three characters now to exclude them you know all we have to do is 
increment i by 2. i is going to increment by 1 each iteration of the loop. If these, res these statements resolve to true, then we're going to iterate it two extra spaces. So it's going to be moving forward by 3, so it's going to exclude that 3 character substring. Now if that resolves to being false, if it's not that unwanted substring, then we're going to go ahead and write that character and append it to our answer variable. So it would be str character at i. And then of course very near the end of the function we're going to return our answer. Okay. Chat at. What is a chat at? Looks like a typo, right? Car at. Here it is. Chat at. Not what I needed. No, oh, now what am I doing here? Ch -ch -ch -ch. Oops, I never put the equals, did I? There we go. And that's going to be the K. And for the most part, we're OK. And what's going on here? Let me see. That's 8. OK, so it looks like we're iterating through this loop But if we increment by 2, then we're running over the end of the length of the string. So what can we do there? If we put in an additional parameter for our conditional here. Okay, so if, let me see, i is less than str length let's see it would be i actually be i plus 2 I think it's plus 2 yeah and there it is so what this is doing is this is just making sure that we're not we're not uh, going to ro run past the end of our string that we're manipulating there. And it all works. I'm not sure if we have any tests. Let me see. Doesn't look like we have any tests for empty strings or anything. And of course we don't have to worry about yak overlapping. And if you look at this, let me see. It looks like almost exactly the same. Well they used the we used the plus equals here. But the if conditional looks like it's just the same. Okay, so on to the next exercise. We have array 667. Given an array of ints, return the number of times that two sixes are next to each other in the array. Also count instances where the second six is actually a seven. Okay, and the logic behind this is is very similar to uh, some of the ones that we've done before. So uh, first we're going to go ahead, we're returning an int, but we're receiving an, an array of integers. But we're going to be returning an int. So int uh, answer, and we're going to initialize that to 0. We're going to set up our for loop. You'll be writing these in your sleep eventually. I uh, is less than. Now, uh, what are we grabbing with these? We're grabbing, we're testing a, a series of three values. So I is going to be nums length, okay, minus two. And then we use the iterator for the integer, for the, uh, for the, for our loop. Okay, and now when we're inside here, 
we're going to have an if. Uh, let me see. So if. Okay, this is only check. Actually, we're only checking two. I thought we were taking chunks of three. So it's actually going to length minus one. So we're going to fix that and change that from minus two to minus one. Okay, and what are we looking for? Looking for two sixes next to each other. So if i, which is the current address, oops, no, i, it would be nums i is equal to 6 and nums i plus 1 is equal to 6. But if we'll note, note here, uh, we're also going to count where the second 6 is a 7. So we'll just be or nums i plus 1 is equal to 7. So if that resolves to true, then we're going to count the number of instances of this. So we're going to take answer and increment it by 1. At the end of the function, we return answer. Let me see. And I'm pretty sure this is going to come out incorrect, at least on some of the tests. Yeah, it looks like it all came out correct. Let me see. And I was thinking if there is a hypothetical, I think we should have broken this up like so. And I really don't like that previous code there because this part, the first six, the first six needs to be a six. That first number needs to be a six. The second one, the one right after that, can be either a six or a seven. And I feel like we really should have that enclosed there. But it seems to work fine, you know, with the uh, without that additional parentheses there. Their solution, I'm sure, is pretty close to the same. And they used nested ifs there rather than one long statement there. The first if i equals uh, nums i equals 6. The second if nums i plus 1 equals 6 or nums i plus 1 equals 7. And increment count and return it. So no triples. Okay, given an array of ints we say that a triple is a value appearing three times in a row in the array. Return true if the array does not contain any triples. Uh, and you'll see this a lot in programming problems, and sometimes you'll see it in real life there, where the logic is a little counterintuitive, because we're returning true if the array does not contain any triples. Okay, so it's uh, you have to be on the lookout for logic being inverted like that. Fortunately in, in programming Java it's very easy to invert uh, logic like that and I'll show you that in just a moment here. So now we're returning a boolean, true or false, uh, and we're taking in an array of integers. Uh, we shouldn't really need us uh, to create a value to, to store the answer. So let's go ahead and start with our 4, int i equals 0. Now, I'm looking at this carefully here. So we are looking at the array in chunks of three elements. Uh, so it is 3. So i is going to be less than nums length minus 2. And there's our incrementor. And inside the loop, we're going to do a quick check. We should be able to do this all in one byte here. So let me see. So nums, oops, nums index i equals what? Well, it's not a specific value, so we're comparing them. So nums i equals nums. i plus 1 
and nums i equals nums i plus 2. And this is actually not going to work. This is not going to work if we just take this at one byte because this is going to return true or false when it looks at the first three. It's not going to check the entire array. So I was actually wrong there, but this logic is still going to hold. So we get to keep that. So we're going to just turn this return into an if. And that conditional still holds. Okay, and then we print this code block. If that is true, then we return. Actually, we can't return yet because we've got to iterate through this several times. But if this is true, we're going to have to have a variable after all. So, boolean answer. And this declares the variable. We don't have to set it to an initial uh, condition. What we can do though is we can set it by default to true. Return true if it does not contain any triples. So now it's going to default to true. If this statement finds a triple then we're going to reset it answer to false. And then at the end of the function here we're going to return the answer. And that should work. And it does. Is this our last one or next to last? Yeah, this is the very last one. So we're going to go ahead and wrap this up. Given an array of ints, return true if it contains a 271 pattern of value, followed by the value plus 5, followed by the value minus 1. Additionally, the 271 counts even if the 1 differs by 2 or less from the correct value. Okay, that seems complicated. As with all complicated problems, the whole idea of programming is to break it down into little pieces that can be understood simply by themselves, assembling it all into an answer. So. Uh, now this is a boolean so what we're going to do is return b -b -b return true if it contains a 271 pattern so what we're going to do is declare the answer as false that's going to be our default and we're going to return that actually we can do that right here return answer okay and in the middle there we're going to be looking for that 271 pattern if we find it we're going to flip the value of answer to true and of course it'll then it'll be true when it returns so here's what we're looking for and we're going to have to step through the array looking for the answer and we're going to be looking at chunks of three elements there so it's going to be nums length minus two and here's going to be the heart of our logic there if and it's 271 pattern. Okay. Now the first part, we don't actually have to check what the value is uh, for index i because it could be any value. It's just its relationship of that value to the two other values. So we're going to look for the 7 part. So the 7 part is the value plus 5. So if nums i plus 1 is equal to nums 
i plus 5. It's going to be 5 more. Okay. And just to make it a little easier to read, we're going to use the extra parentheses there. This is this parenthesis is going to be closing the if block or the if conditional. Put that in there. And then those are this is one statement. Okay, we're checking the first and the second. Checking the second variable, uh, second element against the first. Now we're going to check the third. The value minus one. So nums i equals nums i plus two. That value minus one. And if that is the case, then we're going to change the answer boolean to true. And that gets returned later. So we're pretty close to an answer here. Now, they say additionally, 271 counts even if the one defers by two or less from the correct value. Okay, so it needs to be close. Okay, so instead of nums i plus 2 minus 1, we need it to be off by less than 2. Okay, in other words, we're going to use our absolute value there. So, and let me see. We can do this. Let's see. And that might be easier to do that. Let's see. Let's do a math absolute. And then that's going to be nums. I minus nums I plus two less than two. Oops, what am I missing here? I think I missed a... <laughs> See, 27271... False... Oh, you know what? That's greater than... And we're almost there. 27... Minus 1? Hmm... What's going on there? Shouldn't have to do these backwards. That shouldn't matter. So math abs nums i minus nums i plus two. So less than or equal to two. Is that it? Oops, what happened there? Let me see. So we're looking at less, let's see, value minus 1. Is this minus one? That's the regular value. I might be unnecessarily complicating this. Let me see. 
rather than use the absolute. Let me see. Nums i plus two is greater than or equal to. Let me see. So it would be the see followed by the value minus one. So it's off by two or less. So it would be nums i minus three and nums i plus two less than or equal to nums i plus one. Yeah, well, I think we're missing a. There we go. And there we go. That's correct. So, so what we're looking for is we're checking this nums i plus one is five more than nums i, and then nums i plus two is greater than or equal to nums i minus three, which is one less, but it's actually three less because of the the two, uh, the wiggle room of two there on the low side there, and nums i plus two is less than or equal to nums i plus one, which is nums i minus one with an error tolerance of two on the upside as well. So that was a little trickier than I expected it to be, but we got that worked out. And Oh look, they did use math absolute. <laughs> See math absolute nums i plus two, that's our third value, minus the val oh val that oh they set up a val variable for the nums i. Whereas I didn't use the val I didn't create a variable there, I just used nums i where I needed it. So the value minus one, which is nums i minus one less than or equal to two because that's our tolerance because of the math absolute uh, call. Oh, and I have an unnecessary variable here. So I didn't use their variable uh, val, but I did use an unnecessary variable here. What we do is we can take this, get rid of that. If we find out that this resolves to true anywhere, what we can do is we can just return true instead of assigning it to a variable. Return true. If that happens, then it returns and we never get here. So we can just, if we don't find that is true in any case, we return false as a default. And that runs as well. All right. And that's it for warm up two for coding bat. Java. As you can see there's lots more sections to do and I believe when we were starting uh, with string, actually they'll show hints sometimes but they do not give answers anymore so it's kind of a way of telling you that you completely did not need me at all up to now but uh, in the future I might provide a little more help there because they stopped giving us a cheat sheet there so Thanks so much for tuning in to Cajun Coding, guys. I appreciate you. And as always, uh, like, subscribe, comment, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.